The 1960s found Washington, D.C. in a chaotic storm. The marginalized and the forgotten seemed to wake up, started demanding things like jobs, housing, and education. They started marching for equal rights and opportunities for a better life in America. Yes, something was in the air, a new thing. It was against this backdrop that two men, passionate about black cultural identity and political consciousness, came together to give birth to the new school of Afro-American thought. The late poet Gaston Neal of Pittsburgh and Howard University student activist Don Freeman of Oakland designed and developed what would become a gathering place for education, organizing, and culture. Don Friedman is the sole surviving founder of the new school. Known affectionately as Baba, he continues to advocate and educate inner city communities on sustainability and empowerment. Gaston and I, and, and Remsky has, could have some claim on it, because Remsky is the one who decided that the name is, we should use the name new school. Um, but actually, it was Gaston and I who started the school. And there was a, a, a outgrowth of the Cardoza Area Arts Committee, which had just published and just produced a monumental three-day musical cultural expression called Three Days of Soul that Gaston had, had produced. Gaston produced this as a, as a staff member of the United Planning Organization. The United Planning Organization paid for this production, uh, Three Days of Soul. That was a major, it probably had 25 or 30 different groups from all over the country come in and perform uh, and trace the development of black music from African styles to what Sun Wa was doing at the time. So we had all, every expression, we had choirs, we had blues, we had tap, we had African dance, we had uh, uh, many expressions of jazz, we had uh, poetry, rhythmic poetry, like the last poets performed, like we had. It was a major, if not a, a primary cultural event. It was called Three Days of Soul. It took place at Cardoza Area Arts Committee. Uh, it was right after that that I convinced Gaston Neal that we had to go beyond that expression. We were looking for a follow-up. Gaston and I, and I and Remsky and all the other people who were involved were looking for a follow-up to Three Days of Soul. I came up with the idea that we needed an institution, not a program. So, and what would this institution be? Uh, the notion of a school. A school, and well, why would we create a school? Well, one of the reasons why we would create a school is because Howard University itself was such a troublesome entity in the sense that it never really fully or even began to accept its responsibility to do anything other than to produce people for jobs. Howard, we begin to see Howard University as a, a, a mill, a factory mill that produced jobs essentially that white people needed to be filled by black people. We were trying to simultaneously target the homeless, which we had around us all the time. The drug addict, which we had us all around, around us all the time, which interesting enough becomes the story with Gaston and many people there. Black people with problems. What we understood, which was part of the magic of the school, is that we all had problems. That black people had problems across the political and economic spectrums that was associated and related to their blackness, to their African ancestry. That their problems were not just their individual problems. That the divorce rate, that the hunger rate, that the homeless rate, that the glass ceiling rate, that the discrimination on tests, that the the uh, lunch counter discrimination, all of those were in some way or in part related to their African ancestry. That was, so we targeted everyone. Now we didn't get to everybody in the sense that we started out with people who were into jazz and into culture and we could be attracted, because that's the way we could attract people. Uh, we had art shows of which the average the homeless person might not be interested. But the interesting thing is that they were. And I, I, I want to talk a little bit about Gaston's drug problem because that was both a positive and a negative for us. Gaston was an example of a person with a drug problem who was very sophisticated, who, would, who could understand the art shows, who could write poetry, was a tremendous poet, who knew everybody in town, but he had a drug problem. 
and that there were many people with drug problems who were just as sophisticated as Gaston, or almost as sophisticated as Gaston. The musicians had drug problems. Yes, the homeless had drug problems. Yes, the, the down and out had drug problems, but the not so down and out. The doctors had drug problems. Many of them were outgrowths and functions of their blackness, or their African ancestors, their depression, the, 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 eating, the bad food that they ate, the lack of exercise, the high divorce rates. They're all figured into their, their problem as a black person. And a lot of this can, in fact, be traced. Not all of it, but a lot of it can be traced to the slave trade, to destroying, us, destroying our culture, uh, refusing to allow us to play our drums. The reason about to directly man, we had to alter that. We had to create music. Now, some you can make the argument, oh, we created jazz, we created blues, and that was a good thing. Well, it's never a good thing to destroy a person's cultural continuity. You altered it in a way that we made it good. We took the lemons and we made lemonade. Don't tell us you didn't give us lemons to eat. They were, they were our chitlins, if you will. We made the same thing you, your analogy talks about lemons. Our analogy is you, we took chitlins and made a gourmet food out of it. Chitlins today are a gourmet food because we did that. We made the lemonade. You didn't give it to us. You gave us your throwaways. You gave us the chitlins. We cleaned them, we spiced them, we found ways of eating them, we sell them back to you. But the problem is if we can't sell them back to you, you end up selling them to us. And therein lies the problem. We can't even benefit from our culture. You know, that's today's world. That's not, that's today's world. Okay. And that's the, the origins of the New School for African American Thought are in that reality. In the fall of 1965, the New School of Afro-American Thought was founded. It was one of a handful of politically active cultural centers in the country. In its six years, the New School operated near Florida Avenue on 14th Street in Northwest Washington. The New School became the neighborhood nexus for political debates, educational forums, and performances by artists. On any day, a visitor could bump into any number of artists, poets, and politicos. Although the school received no government or private funding, its impact and accomplishments were significant. In particular, it's noted as the first adult African-centered school in the nation's capital, and possibly the country. The new school was also noted for serving as a major African cultural venue featuring poetry and jazz. The New School opened DC's first black bookstore. And the New School was responsible for establishing the district's Eastern High School Freedom Annex. It was at the Freedom Annex where young people could learn and explore various aspects of African culture. The New School had a primary role in the formation of the United Black Front including hosting the first meeting and helping to set the agenda for the standing room only gathering. The roster reads like a who's who. The new school authored the first definition of African education. In 1968, new school delegates stormed the Afro-American Educators Conference in Chicago. They presented a paper entitled The Meaning of Education a new approach for African-centered education, one that would define and enhance black cultural identity and capability. It was the only conference paper selected to be published in the National Journal of Negro Education. The new school was instrumental in understanding that our identity pre-colonialism and pre-slavery were critical to addressing our in internal problems. What had been, it, the problems of what had been made of us out of our slavery experience, out of our colonial experience, was a problem that we suffered both from internally and externally. Curing the internal suffering and problem was what the, that was returning to that culture that was based before we had that experience was the key to addressing that problem. It was both the key to addressing it internally and externally internally because we cease to become our own worst enemy. The dilemma of black people today is quite often we are our own worst enemy. Anybody who's honest can recognize that. Anybody who's dishonest and still wants to hide and, and, and obfuscate the truth will deny that. You know, uh, we have become to a great extent our own worst enemy. 
You know, we can cite Samley's example. The key to the new school was to understand that our cultural identity was the foundation for addressing all of our problems, or most of our problems. I can't say all of them, because that would be dishonest, or that would be disingenuous, it would be, but most of them, most of those problems. On the block that we were in, uh, and we were at 2208 14th Street. 2208 14th Street is the, was the address of the original New School of African Americans block. On that block, there were three businesses that dispensed alcohol. Two stores, one in one corner and one in the other corner. And in the middle of the block was a bar that also had a, a, a after hours hangout spot for people. So alcohol being one of the primary problems in the black community, the consumption of alcohol, us coming to that neighborhood. Also, there was a nonprofit that did good things in that life. But the, but the street in the neighborhood was inundated like many black, black uh, uh, communities with alcohol dispensing operations, drug problems, prostitution, lots of negativity, a lot of problems for people, a lot of things that their children can get involved with. All of a sudden they had this school in which they could come to classes free, they could see cultural presentations free, they could see jazz musicians free, they could come and have their children have classes that they could attend, uh, they themselves could come free, we didn't charge them, we encouraged them, we didn't discourage them because they had on dirty clothes or because they came from work, or we, we encouraged them to come in. We out, we were, and also we were connected to the movement. They saw it as connected to the civil rights movement. They didn't make a distinction between us because, and, and, and they saw important people coming into the neighborhood. Where else could they see Stokely come into the neighborhood? Where else could they see Marion Barry come into the neighborhood? Where else would they see P.D. Green? Where else would they see uh, uh, celebrities in their neighborhood? We were a plus to that community and that community responded. Where else could they organize? Could they come in and sit down and use the facilities for free? They could do that nowhere else than at the New School for Afro-American Thought. So the, our relationship with our community was fantastic. The address of the New School was 2208 14th Street. That was the original address of the New School that existed there for about a year and a half. Moved across the street to 2115 14th Street. That building no longer exists. The new school building actually currently exists today. It's still there. Everyone knew that Gaffin was different. First, he was high energy. He had more energy than people around him, you know, in, in his speech. He also was deep. He was a person in great thought. Well, I may, maybe I should say, you know, maybe most poets are deep in thought, you know, because they're thinkers. And that's what Gaston Neal was. You know? I had an interest in doing something after, after the riots. I didn't do anything during the riots. And what I wanted to do was to show these two figures that were very important. They were important to us as black folks during that time. And that was Stokely Carmichael and Gaston Neal. You know, two different, with the New School of Afro-American Thought, they asked Neal up here. Then you had Stokely Carmichael from SNCC from down the uh, 1200 block of U Street. You know, they're together up on top of the, the ruins there. So I, I said, wow, let me get that, you know. I wasn't in the midst of when the, the burning was going on, but I, I got to experience the aftermath. In, 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 the, in, the 40, in the 40 plus years since I left the new school, uh, I've been a wife, a mother, a designer, fashion stylist, editor for a magazine, an art teacher, um, uh, an artist who's exhibited at the Smithsonian, um, a, a, a motivational speaker for children and for women. So I've had a very full and uh, blessed life, but the cornerstone to who I am is my Afrocentric view which was formed at the new school, so I have to I have to give um, I, I have to give um, all, all the accolades that I can to the new school being such an integral part of my development as uh, as a 
as a black woman, let, let me say this t- to you. Um, in 1992, I lived in Los Angeles. And uh, during the Rodney King insurrection. And as I was leaving church uh, the Sunday after the Rodney King uh, insurrection, a film crew from France approached me. I have four sons. And so I guess, you know, they saw, saw me and my kids and they walked up to me and wanted to know could they follow me home, which, you know, I told them yes, and they, and they did. Okay, when they saw me, I had on all my uh, typical black woman, church, big hat, the jewelry, the gloves, the whole nine yards. When I got home, I changed clothes. And I put on my African clothes, and wrapped my head in a gay lay, and looked in the camera and said, I am an African woman who lives in America who speaks English. Because I knew that that was going to be seen in all the Francophone countries, and I wanted to reach out to all those black people in France and in French-speaking Central African, West African, let them know, all the way in Los Angeles, California, with a Volvo parked in my driveway, and my nice manicured lawn, and the cinders flying in the breeze, and the palm trees and all of that, I considered myself an African woman living in America who speaks English. And that came from my understanding of my place in the world. So I take my hat off to Don Freeman and to Gaston Neil, may you rest in peace, uh, for introducing me to, um, to myself and to my people where I belong in the world scene. Yes, uh, definitely, uh, not only the community that surrounded it, but, the, but throughout, Southeast, Northeast, uh, everybody, Petey Green, uh, uh, people like that came to the new school. People came up looking for uh, some type of uh, uh, connection. Uh, it was not only SNCC, but the uh, Black Man's Liberation Army opened a, a facility right across the street. Everything was sort of like located in that one area there, around uh, the Coat Lounge and the Flamingo Club, uh, which was a uh, basic jazz club in D.C. And a lot of people came to 14th and V, 14th and U, 14th and W to find out what was happening. A lot of people came to our stores. I had aspirations to be, you know, the church going, uh, 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 Cadillac driving, you know, brother that, you know, that married the light-skinned woman and all of that and became uh, part of the uh, so-called uh, a bourgeoisie. That was my aspiration. and. Uh, and after the new school, I didn't have those, those feelings anymore. I had the feeling of, I had to remake myself. I had to change. I had to remake myself into somebody that I could see as somebody that was, uh, had served in the military, had been a combat person, had come out and actually changed my whole attitude. So, uh, you know, so the woman that I was married to, the first thing I did was get a divorce, you know, because, uh, my father's uh, opinion of her was, you know, hey, she's she's fine. She's got good hair and she's light-skinned, you know. So that was his, his attitude at the time. So that was back in 1959, you know. So uh, that, was, that was the deal. Presented, and there were both. There was 
a serious and a firecracker. Mama Dude was a firecracker. Baba was the serious. And I, it was a rallying cry. I mean, Mama Dude's lectures were a rallying, rallying cry for revolution. And that's what I really remember. I mean, I always came out of the new school feeling good, feeling like I had a task, I had a job to do, and that's what I remember of the new school. And there were a whole lot of people, there were a whole lot of people full of the, the energy and the excitement about the struggle that black people have to go through. First, you know, it's a positive self-image as a black person. The media is constantly bombarding us with negative self-images. And there is no new school to go to to tell you that you are part of an ancient culture and you need to grow and be a good representative of that culture. And we don't have a place to teach us that our his our history. We know about Malcolm uh, Malcolm X and Martin Luther King, and you know maybe James Garrett who uh, did the traffic light. But past that, just superficial knowledge of who we are is all our young people are getting, and that doesn't give them the foundation, the desire to to do what is necessary to develop our communities here and on the continent and basically in the diaspora of African Americans. There is a need for a new school for these young people. This school totally changed my life. It gave me a focus and a direction for my life. And you don't know how happy you are, you can be when you are driven with the purpose, uh, and that purpose is community building, nation building, and that's what the new school gave me, it gave me a focus for my life, and I will always appreciate the new school. I became associated with the new school prior to the riots. I use that as a timeline. Riots were 1968, April. We were, I was in taking classes both prior to that, so I know I have to back up. And um, I don't know how they, uh, I guess we selected. You selected the class that you wanted. There were many classes, but I wanted the history class and Doug Jones was the teacher. And um, Doug structured his class in the same manner that you would in the college history class. We had a textbook, we had assignments, reading assignments. And um, I had, it never occurred to me that Doug didn't know what he was talking about. And uh, I made an attempt to go to class every week, not missing the classes. I really enjoyed it. And I really learned a lot, too. Because um, before, I hadn't given a lot of, well, I don't think I had any reason. The middle passage, that was what really, you know, learning about that. Uh, in my previous readings, I didn't give any time or thought or what have you, which I should have, it was no excuse but Doug opened up a lot that I didn't know. It's through me. Okay, so say it over. <laughs> okay. Impact? impact is through me, my vision as to what they should have, their cultural heritage. And I pass that on to them, hopefully. 
And uh, one of the things they do annually is that last year we call it the Low Country Tour, which would have been Charleston, Savannah, and of course, Beaufort at the Gala Festival. So they can um, learn, their, learn something of their heritage. Why do you think it's important for them, for kids to know anything about, especially black kids, why do you think it's important for them to know something about their culture? I'm about to say, please. <laughs> I mean, some people, think that some people think that we live in a what they call the new term is post-racial, that we're all one and we don't need to identify with, you know, a uh, our, our African heritage. We should be uh, well, you know, in a melting pot. Most of the children we come in contact with here in the district, their grandparents are usually from South Carolina. So they've never, most of them, a long time, well, the, earth, the first group, some of those children have never been to South Carolina. And that's where their ancestors, that's where they were slaves, in South Carolina. So we always like to do South Carolina. Then we put on, add on uh, Savannah, Georgia. It's rich in history. And of course, Beaufort, big slavery, big time in those three those three cities. Why is it important for them to know that history? They are, my goodness, let's see. Well, I figured like this. Okay, I'm gonna get back to why it's important, but that's something they're not gonna get in DCPS. So we do our best to ensure that they get some of that, a good dose of it, so they know who they are, where they came from, so they won't grow up ignorant. Now, during the days of the new school, um, what we did uh, was to build, uh, you know, in terms of building capacity, we, we had, we held s seminars. Uh, we, we held, uh, we had classes. We gave concerts. Uh, uh, various people from, as I mentioned earlier, we had nationally known figures who would come in. We would invite youth. Uh, it, quite frankly, we were all pretty young back in those days. We invited, uh, we would we'd bring these people in. Now, here, these same things are going on here at Emoji House. Now, we don't have uh, as many concerts and things of that nature, but we do have forums. Uh, there's something that we have one almost every every Friday. Uh, we have something going on here. There are uh, one of the things that that is I think we take a lot of pride in is the fact that uh, Kwanzaa, um, that whole holiday, is 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 really organized uh, in Washington out of the Moja House. We help keep that whole thing going out of here. Uh, we intend to, to as I mentioned earlier, these, the, using the technologies that, to, to, to broadcast on it. We're in the, in, the, in the throes of doing that just now. We are planning to do that. So uh, in, in the early part of next year, you will see a webcast and things of that nature. And we can influence a lot of those kids who are out there now. We can give them more information than they can get from watching uh, these, uh, the football games, the basketball games and things, there's more to it. We have a chance now to really influence many people, many, not only the kids, but, but parents and, 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 and even uh, the larger society by providing information about who we are uh, uh, in a positive sense.